know, I know this is an election season and everything, and everybody asks me why do I talk to leaders and people that are out there on the road. This is why, because when I went to the Unity with Pam event, you know, Kia got up there, she talked about what she had to, she talked to the crowd, she didn't get there making a political platform. She went up there with a message and inspired so many. And I knew right then I want a Kia at our next event. And I'm thankful for that. Thank you. Let's give her a big round of applause. Is our mayor here yet? Okay, we're still waiting on her. I know she's a very busy lady in the community, so we'll go to the next segment, which will be... Oh my, it's me. <laughs> oh well, yeah. As you can see, we've been all over the world. And one of the things that we've been doing um, the last couple of months and, and years and everything is getting out there and spreading this message about HIV and how it affects people in our valley and how it affects people at home. And you know, I'm so glad that this year we talked about ostracization of people and the families or what have you. Because when we ostracize people, we judge them. And who are we to judge? We're supposed to lift each other up, love them, give them the tools they need to not only survive, but to elevate to go up, to go upwards. We want everybody out there, everywhere, whether you're HIV positive or not, whether you're gay, whether you're straight, whether you're African American or white, whoever you are, we are all one thing. We're all Americans, and we all deserve to strive for the top. And that's exactly what we do with all of our people here at the Better Way Foundation. We try to give them all goals. We try to give them roles that they can do to participate here in the Valley. And, you know, I being a gay man, I mean, you know, because this year I created something else. Everybody always asks me, because not only do we ostracize people whether they're HIV positive or not, and we do that in our own communities. The gay communities do it to themselves. It's something that I've seen and, and witnessed and just floored by. These are the people that are around you that are dying. These are the people that are around you that are trying to stay alive. And yet you shut your, you shut them. You shut the doors to them. You turn your backs on them. And that's why every person that's out there, you know, when I first started this organization six years ago, I didn't want it to be about gay or straight because we had so much work to do to change the mindsets of what had taken place here where everybody thought it was only a gay disease, when it wasn't. When women, African-American women, are dying. When so many are becoming infected. And I was like, we must change the course how we're doing business here. We've got to change the perception of HIV. And I think we've done that for the most part here. Have we not? Do I hear a round of applause that we've done a great job with that? Because we now understand that HIV affects anyone, every race, every age, every creed. does not matter who you are. It does not discriminate. It could care less who you sleep with at night because the virus will live on as long as we continue to let it. We have to make sure that we protect ourselves. We have to make sure that we protect our children with the education that they need, with the tools that they need, including condoms. We must talk about all the factors that go into sex education, not just one view, but real science-based education that where we can all survive. You know, some of the work that we've done right here in Columbus, Georgia, and I'm proud of it, I want all of you, if you can, before you leave, we've got some AIDS watch packages. And I was very, very honored to attend in Washington, D.C. this year and uh, go to Representative Lewis's office and uh, Gingrey's office and all these other, uh, Gingrey, he had an elf on the wall. Uh, that was a bit odd for me. But yeah, I mean, Representative Lewis's office, when we all took that picture right out there on the balcony and looked over and saw our Capitol building. It was a feeling in your heart, like we are really doing important work here. Not just me, but 646 other people living with HIV and AIDS all around the country. All 50 states were represented. All had a packet in our hands to go forth. I had no idea what we had to endure just to get ADAP spending, just to get the corrected sex education 
literature for our children, just so we could get more information about Brian White or what have you, or more funding or more dollars. I have no idea. These people work tirelessly every year to go up there and make sure that you've got the funds necessary. Then you've got people that want to play political games with your life, like right here in his own state, with our governor who chose not to activate Medicaid expansion, but instead let all the people that depend upon it, including Glenn in the back, who can't get his meds, because there is no Medicaid expansion to help the poorest of the poor. Even though the money's there, even though you've already paid the tax dollars for it, the money that was already allocated by our federal government, our governor said, we don't need it. You don't need it. I hope you'll remember that in November. When we honor all the people that we've lost, we sometimes forget at these events to lift up those that are living. It's very important that we look to our left and our right to remember that this could be your child, this could be your sister, this could be your brother. Let's not ostracize our families any further. When we have to live in the shadows, that's not living. When we have to not talk about what's going on at home because we're afraid what this person might think, we're not living. We owe it to ourselves, we owe it to each other, to live for each other, to live for ourselves and lift ourselves up at every opportunity that we can to make sure that every person out there, like Juanita share, and like all the other people that work with our agency share every day about their status. Because we educate, we lift people up and let them know that every battle that you go through, someone else has been there. Someone else has walked that path. Someone else can give you that little tidbit that's going to help you get through the nausea or the diarrhea or whatever comes with the meds. Or might even help you with some tips to help fight lipoastrophy or lipodystrophy. All the things that make us either blow up or shrink away. I'm not proud to say I have seen many, many people that have lost their lives to HIV and AIDS. And I'm even sadder to say that so many of them gave up. Because those people, let me tell you, they didn't die from HIV or AIDS. They died from a broken heart. They died because nobody else cared. Because nobody picked up the phone to say, how are you doing, son? I love you. Or how are you doing, mom? I love you. When I hear the stories of how these mothers talk to their children about their virus, it touches my heart because that takes such courage and such bravery to share that part of your side, your life, with a child that the comprehension level is not all there. But you know the one thing that is always there in every family once they share? I love you, mama. I don't want to lose you, mama or daddy, or sister, or brother. Even my one, oh, my own brother told me that. When I went to the hospital years ago after breaking my hip, because I let myself get down in the dumpster, I picked up the drugs just like Juanita did, dipping and dabbing. Because I tell you, the pain of having to live a life where you can't be yourself, where you can't talk to people about it, you can't even go to church without them condemning you for your lifestyle. But there are churches that do care, just like we're having art, and yours, and mine. There's people out there that share with us, that love us no matter what. It says love the sinner, not the sin. We lift each other up every day in everything that we do because we love each other. I love my family. I love my friends. I love everybody that's in this room today because you know why? You took some special time out of your Sunday between church and family dinner and everything else to share a little bit of time with not just me, but all 25 million people that have lost their lives to AIDS. 34 million are out there walking around right now with this disease. Most without care. 
We're trying to lengthen the care. And one of the things I'm so proud of, and I shared with Sarah earlier from WTVM, was that right here, when you look at that AIDS Watch program, look at the back and look at the work that we're doing right here with our National HIV Testing Days, with our programs that we do at every event. We can still have uh, testing going on here. But in Columbus, Georgia, we had 101 people diagnosed with HIV in the year 2012. That same year, less than 30% had stage three. So we are catching them quicker. If you go on that same list and look, look at DeKalb, look at Fayetteville, look at Fulton, look at Valdosta. The numbers are in the 500s of people diagnosed with HIV and over half already have stage three because we're not getting that message there to them quick enough. We're not getting out there and telling everybody of every age, of every race, that the CDC now recommends that you get tested once a year. That's how we end the epidemic, is testing. Making sure, and people think, oh, it doesn't apply to me, I'm happily married. Well, tell that to our mayor that's been there for the last two years to come out there. Let's give her a big round of applause as well, to come out there a year after year and promote awareness throughout our, throughout our city and let the people know, I'm here, I'm part of leadership, and this is what is expected of me. Yes, I will take the test to promote awareness. Yes, I will do these things, Mr. Hobbs. And she's done it to the core. And again, she might not be here yet, but let's give Mayor Thomason a big round of applause for her service to the city and her fight against HIV and AIDS. You know, one of the, I, I, I know I talk about a lot of things, I, I don't want to get in trouble for now. And sometimes I just don't get back up. I remember one guy that was over in Phoenix City, his name was Joey. And his family, they didn't even bury him. They just had a quick start, they didn't notice no service. They just had him cremated and he was forgotten. He wasn't forgotten by me. I'll always remember Joey. I'll always remember Raphael who was the first person I ever found out had HIV. Also shared the same birthday. He came out a long time ago because he came down here from uh, uh, New York. And people treated him so poorly. I didn't. I loved him the same. And I didn't even have HIV then. Also another person that, the first person I ever opened up about my own status to and Eddie Junior Andrews. I miss him every day. The twang in his voice. How are y'all doing over there? Had the greatest southern accent I ever heard of anybody. And he could warm the room in a minute. But I saw him pass horribly. And his mother, I remember we would go to his house during the last few days, and, or even before that. Everything in the refrigerator was separated in plastic bags. Plastic bags written on this for mom, do not touch. If it had been messed with in any way, she would throw it away. She even had a special bathroom built on for it that him and his guest could use. Because she was afraid, I guess she'd sell a seat, she might, might rub off, you never know. <laughs> These are the types of stigma and ignorance that we face every day. We still face it. Not as much as we used to, but we still see it out there in the open. I still got people that, when I extend my hand to shake, or, you know, because I'm a hugger. Uh, I get that from my mom, I guess. You know, we love to hug, and we give you a big old bear hug. But when you extend your hand to them, they pull away. It's not gonna rub off. And God knows neither is gay, so either way, you're okay. But our, our goal on this road of discovery, and I don't even know what mine is completely yet. I mean, I'm still on that path. I'm still learning each and every day. 
When I went to Washington, D.C., I learned. When I go to these events, I learned. When I go to these other places, I learned. You know, there's all kinds of events that people want. Jeremy, can you come here? Jeremy, can you go there? Jeremy, can you speak here? Jeremy, can you speak here? And I keep saying yes, and yes, and yes, and yes, and yes. Why? Because if I don't even care about the program sometimes, and there's sometimes that, you know, we're talking about squirrels and habitats. I'm like, okay, what am I here for? Um, but at the same time, you hear, you meet that one person that's in the audience. You meet that one person that's to your right. And you say, that's what I was here for. God puts us where he needs us. Whether it's a meeting, an event, right here at the podium. Because somewhere in that message, somewhere in that room, somebody's going to touch your life, inspire you, and that involves you to go out there even stronger the next day and make things happen and pave that better way. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before I turn over the floor to you, because this is your moment, I want to invite everyone to, Monty, if you'll stand up, I mean, excuse me, not Monty, uh, Ms. Angelica, if you'll stand up, if you see this right here, uh, Angelica made these, handmade, red ribbons, from the Nutterway Foundation. If any of you would like one of these, be sure you stop by and see her. She'll tell you about them. She also has some other patterns and things like that that she does. She does all of her better way creations, and we want to give her a big round of applause for everything she does. She gets there, she sews it. She's also now our assistant secretary of the agency, so let's give her a big round of applause. Lynn Smith, our secretary, very proud. He went from, you know, he left us last year, but he's back. We're so proud to have you back. Our uh, vice president, who's not here today, but also our former vice president, Tim Vance. You know, that right there, if you need to know medicines or how they work or anything, Tim Vance, so that's the one you'll talk to. He'll give you an hour long talk about everything you need to know about meds or about HIV uh, or about anything. He's an educator. And I'm, I'm grateful to have these people in my life because, you know, I can't do it alone. We need your help. Don't forget, I want every person, if you can, lift up the voices, lift up the memories of the people that you've lost. Write a name on the balloon before we go outside. Also, we have candlelight vigil, light, lighting. I'm just going to let everybody know. We will uh, have that at the very end of the ceremony. But now, who would like to come to the floor? Who would like to share a story about someone you've lost, about someone you love, someone that's living? Come forth now. We ask that you come on up here and talk a little bit about it. This is the time to remember those people. This is the time to lift their memories up. Because if you probably recall back in the 90s, most of them never even had this experience. None of them ever had somebody to say, I lost my son, I lost my wife, I lost my brother, I lost my sister. This is the time to lift them up. So I ask now, please come up front and share your stories. I'm not going anywhere until you do, so you might as well come on up. Come on up, here we go. All right, let's welcome our first person. To, thank you so much. Hey everybody, this is my first time ever coming to one of these. My name is Anna Marie Warren. HIV AIDS. He was diagnosed in 1986 and as soon as he was diagnosed he uh, became a uh, part of the clinical trials at Bethesda at National Institutes of Health and he continued his time with, uh, with uh, the National Institutes of Health uh, all the way until he had passed away in 1998 so he lived from 86 to 98 and during that time, uh, our, old, our, our mother had passed away from cancer in 1992. Shortly after that, my brother and I, who at the time, we lived in Southeast Kansas, and we became co-founders of what is uh, now a defunct uh, uh, organization, but it was called ARNOS, 11 Southeast Rural Counties in Kansas. We covered those counties, all volunteer, nobody paid, we, our way, we just did education, uh, everything. And um, 
we went ahead and, and met some people over in a, in a little town, a, a larger town in Pittsburgh, Kansas, and they had a, a college there. And so we had some of the instructors, the dean of, the, of a library, we had the dean of the nursing department there, and a few others who were helping us pull this together. And back then, it's like just like Jeremy was talking about, it, it was very difficult. Uh, there wasn't that, there wasn't uh, any education right there in that community. My brother came to live with me, and the first thing I thought before we started this organization is, I need to get information about him, about what I can do with him and for him, and then for my family. I had younger, I had three young kids at the time, and there wasn't anything out there, nothing. And so we went to the local health department, and it was, and then we had a very small uh, Red Cross office, and we just kept going and kept going, and then when we met with the ones over in the other town, we kind of got some more information, and we just created the grassroots organization that it helped everybody, um, helped get medications and helped get the, mostly it was, it was education awareness with the colleges, the high schools, and the civic groups that were in, in the community. We went, my brother and I, we would talk to the, you know, the different groups there that would allow us to come in so they could understand how they might be able to help this group of people who so badly needed it and so that they could know how to help with uh, funding the organization, the, the uh, education for everyone. So I just want to say I, I'm so blessed. I, I moved from Kansas to Georgia, and short, sometime after that, I met Jeremy um, at, at uh, on a World Day, World Days Day, and I really haven't been active in this. I've been kind of stepped away. Um, but I truly, truly appreciate everything that you and you and your organization is doing because we can't get enough ed ed education on HIV and AIDS. And quite frankly, I'm sitting here, when I came, this is my first time, I'm just really floored that there aren't more people. This still is something that's out there. It needs to be discussed and shared with everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Hey, you know, normally there are, I, 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 will give the, I will give Columbus a little slack here. Normally we do have some more people. I mean, we've got uh, the last few five years, I guess after five, it's like, okay, this is six, so let's just take a break. You know, um, but at the same time, there is no breaks in HIV. There's no breaks in the epidemic. Until there's a cure, that's when you can have a break. How about that? All right, All right who's our next person that wants to come up and talk, please? Come on down. No, I'm not going anywhere until you do. Oh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in fact, I'll tell you all to get a little bit more courage. Let me go ahead and welcome the lady of the hour. The person is always responsible for making sure that we have this venue, that we have the very best. Ladies and gentlemen, our honorable Mayor Teresa Tomlinson. Let's give her a round of applause. I'm ready for you. Yeah. They said you want to end it out. Well, it is so great to be here, and I apologize for my late arrival, but let me tell you, Columbus, Georgia is a city on the move. This is my sixth event today. My sixth event today because so much is going on in Columbus, Georgia. They're praising the Lord from stem to stern. They're celebrating the arts, and they're, and they're memorializing those that passed before us who suffered from AIDS, some who died of ignorance and some who died alone because we as a nation didn't know. And I want to speak today to some observations of how far we've come. You know, there's been a play on Broadway, there's going to be a movie, and everybody needs to go see it to remember. Some of y'all are old enough to remember that when the AIDS epidemic first came into our lives, the fear the fear and the ignorance, and we should learn from that moment so that we're never repeated again. But brothers and sisters were dying and people didn't know what to do and they were gripped in fear and they were gripped in ignorance and they were paralyzed. There were very, very few people that took action. And like in most great things in, in our country and, and frankly in humanity, a few seemingly small people stepped up to make a point and to give a voice to the issue and the epidemic. And I remember when they laid the first quilts out on the malls in Washington and it gripped the nation. It gripped the entire world because it was a visual manifestation of what we've been hearing but wanted to turn our eyes away from. 
We didn't want to have to really see or hear about our friends or neighbors or their sons or daughters who had died because of AIDS. We didn't have to want to experience that. But when they laid these quilts out and covered the malls in Washington with the names and information about people who had died, and we had a deaf ear and a blind eye to it. And a nation stood up and said, we're going to do something. We will not be gripped in fear and ignorance. We began educating ourselves and learning more and more about it and learning that this, that this disease did not discriminate anyone. Anyone who, who came into contact with the virus could have the virus. But then, of course, the hope and the promise of people surviving and babies born with AIDS surviving. And we knew our, our human ingenuity and our human spirit, hope for promise, knew we could beat this. We could beat this if we came together. And so when we come together today through the Better Way Foundation leadership of Jeremy Hobbs, Jeremy, you and this community, which you and those members of the Better Way Foundation have done, cannot be underestimated because you were the voice in Columbus. You all were the voice in Columbus that those same folks were up on the Mall of Washington. Letting this community know to not take it for granted, these 202,000 people that live here that know that we could educate ourselves. Because it's really, it's, the, it's fear and ignorance that's the death. Knowledge and, and hope, that's life, folks. That's life. Knowledge and hope. And so the fact that we come together to celebrate where we've been and how far we've come is critically important. We can never forget. We have, we have to remember the fear and ignorance that gripped us for a moment in time and delayed us from saving our brothers and sisters. We have to remember so we can go forward and save those tomorrow. And that's what getting tested, the education, information that you do, the programs, the reach out programs, eliminating the stigma, letting us know to extend the hand of human compassion. It's what God intends for us to do. It's what, we're, it's what our moral humanity requires us to do. And that's why you're gathered here today. I thank God for you all coming here today to not forget, to not forget and put your wheel to the, to the grindstone that we will go forward and make sure that those today and tomorrow know to get tested, that they know their own physical circumstance because there are answers and there's hope and promise in every corner today. And there's human compassion in every corner today. But you can't let your own ignorance or your neighbor's ignorance stop you from getting that hope and promise. And so I thank you for giving us this opportunity, Jeremy, to come together to raise awareness so that we go out and spread the word, so that we go out and get tested, even if you know what the answer to the test is. Go out and get tested to lead and show how easy it is to come out and know, and know. Take that stigma away from those that might be fearful and, and show them how to do it. Show them how beautiful knowledge is. So again, I thank you so much for being here today. It is so critically important that we remember. It's critically important that we remember and that we go forward into our communities and we spread this knowledge and this hope so that nobody else would have to suffer what those folks that were first laid out on the Washington Mall had to suffer. Thank you all so very much for coming out today. You are the best of Columbus, Georgia, and the best of the River Valley region. And again, I thank God for you. The hardest working mayor, again, ladies and gentlemen, Fritz Thomas. We are truly blessed to have leadership that cares. Um, you know, I've been doing this for, like I said, a good while, uh, under two administrations, I believe. Uh, three, including yours, yes. Uh, I never could get them to come out, but, you know, Jim Weatherton, he stepped up. There's only been one mayor that stepped up there and gave the finger. 
<laughs> Needless to say, to get pricked. And got, took the test and once again became the first mayor to get publicly tested for to pro uh, promote status knowledge. Again, Teresa Thomas. Let's give her a big round of applause. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, who wants to, does anybody else want to come up and share it now? You know, your mayor's here, you can get up and talk to, talk in front of her, come on, let's go, let's hear some more stories of people that want to talk about the ones we've lost, the ones we love. Anyone? Yeah, come on. Thank you, John, Mr. Harry Underwood. Let's give him a round of applause. Welcome. Hi, my name is Harry Underwood. Um, I moved here recently from, uh, from Warner Robins, Georgia, and I'm here to memorialize my uncle, uh, Mark Underwood. He died in January 1996 of AIDS, HIV, or the complications thereof. And I remember the last time that I saw him alive, and I was around like eight or nine years old at the time. Um, we had gone up to St. Louis, where most of my fam uh, both my relatives live, uh, but my mom and dad's side. And when I, yeah, I remember that, uh, that that one night where me, my mother, and my aunt Peggy, we went uh, and visited my uncle Mark. And by this time, it was he, he was a very different sight than any, than the last time I had seen him. Um, he was openly gay, he was an African-American male, and so he was, uh, in, the, in the 90s, in the earlier 90s, this made him like such a prime target for HIV. And I remember distinctly uh, that after he, we, uh, we had found out that he had died, he had, and, and we had buried him at Jefferson Barracks because he was a, 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 a military veteran, um, I found out that he had gone and started going to church. He recanted his sexual orientation um, as if it was something to be, you know, recanted at the time. Um, and 2010s. Now that I've looked more at LGBT rights and at the rights of um, people who have the, uh, such statuses as HIV and how they were stigmatized the last two to three decades. It makes, it makes me very upset about how, about what they went through and what sort of, you know, what, what sort of um, a horrendous, harrowing experiences that they had to undergo. And then reading about how, as you mentioned, you saw a number of people die of HIV and how they wasted away. And I can't imagine how when, in the 80s, when it started hitting in places like San Francisco and New York City, and friends started seeing their friends dying of HIV, and how they wasted away, and how they developed a Kaposi sarcoma, um, lesions on their, on their skin, and how they lost weight, how they became near skeletons before their very eyes. It makes, it should make one really much more adamant about what should be the better expectations now that we live in the 21st century. So this is why I, I look back at, at, at my uncle's experience and I personally want to know more about him. I want to know more about what sort of experiences he had, what led to his diagnosis and what sort of harrowing experiences he found himself in. And how that, now that we live in the, 20, the, the 2010s, how much better we should know about who we are and what we can be, what sort of potentialities we can reach in this, uh, in the, in this day and age when we do have Trivada, when we do have PrEP, when we do have these mechanisms, these medical mechanisms that are much more advanced than what they were back when my uncle was living his last few days of life. So, I'm here from my uncle, Mark Underwood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's give him a great round of applause for the wonderful story. Who else would like to share a story? 
Just the time. Come on, bro. Have a, Michael, we'll go back to the thought. Our sound guy, he's not going to be able to join us. Also, let me do a big, quick shout out. You see this gentleman over here taking the photos? That's Greg Rice. Been with us for the last six years. Been with Pam Unity with Pam for many, many years. Let's give him a big round of applause. Also, we're supposed to have uh, Brian Roberts here. He's busy. He's got another event. They understand that he's the hardest sound man that works in Columbus, Georgia, too. So let's give him a big round of applause, even though he could be here. Hi, my name is Patricia, and um, I'll, first I'm going to say I'm old. I'm kind of privileged to be old, but I was back in the day when we were dancing in the bars, having a great time, being alive, and they started putting signs up at the bars that said grit. They said it was called gay-related immune deficiency. And of course I said, you know, these people just don't want us to stop dancing. There's no such thing as the gay cancer, as they called it. And all of a sudden, my friends started getting sick. I wish I could come up here and memorialize one or two or three or four or 10 or 12 or 50 people, but it's more than that. We, you know, you, the people would start to get a look and you could tell that they were sick. A lot of times they were afraid to say it, not just to us, their friends, because we were the last people that they had that because their families had already rejected them. And they would get the look, and that look said that they were sick. And so I'm a much nicer and happier person now, but back then I was angry. I was in a group called ACT UP, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. I was in the streets all the time, fighting the same way to one their the way that I felt like I was fighting for my friends' lives. I felt like I was fighting for my own life. And I missed them so much. That's what finally got me over my anger. The fact that sometimes I just um, will, you know, I'll, I will YouTube, I will read old letters of people that have been dead for so long, for no reason. When I say I'm old, I'm not even that old. They just died young. And so I would like to uh, memorialize one friend, David, uh, David Allen Romberg, that I used to know in um, Gainesville, Florida. And he was the person that taught me how to become, um, um, how to um, perform um, HIV tests. And uh, they had a confidential HIV test back in Gainesville, Florida then. And I ran a women's clinic. And I, there was a time where confidential was not enough. You had to have an anonymous HIV test. Because even if your insurance carrier knew that you were being tested for HIV, your rates could go could skyrocket. So we had to find a place, a safe place. And so I continued to look for I mean, there's there's I mean, there's safer places now. I still don't think that there's a safe place for my heart because my heart still aches and it always will. Ha did I do enough? I hope so, but I want to keep continuing. My friend Irene Cicada, I don't even know her brother's name, but she told me that when he finally told her family, and there were nine kids in the family, that he had AIDS, they all rushed up to Maine because he had moved from um, from Miami to get away from the family because he was afraid because he was a young, gay, Peruvian man back in the you know 80s. And they came and they stood by his bedside for 29 years, for 29 days while he died. And that was it. Yep, he was already at death's door. There's so many stories, and the stories are rich. And sometimes people, will, I mean, but there's a name and a place, a name and a face and a heart to go with each and every story. They're missed so much. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I mean, I could do this for hours because there's just been, there's hours and things to talk about and people to talk about and people to love and people to miss and mostly to love. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.